Antonis. Actually, it says on your on your screen there, Antonius. Um, but I, all I hear all the time is Antonis, or that's what I've been saying. So, um, yeah. Antonis, who are you and where are you from? Uh, but yeah, first of all, both versions of my name are correct. It's a, it's a very weird, weird Greek thing that uh, I often have to explain. Uh, it's just that if we remove one vowel, it already becomes informal. Antonius is the formal, Antonius is the informal. Uh -huh. So in Greek, that's all you need to to feel more friendly. Okay. <laughs> so that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's that's about it. So yeah, since I mentioned my name is Greek, then I should also mention that I indeed originally come from Greece, although it has always been hard for me to answer the question where I'm from. Because it's, uh, yeah, who I am is... Uh, I identify with as a human, let's say, <laughs> not necessarily as a uh, Greek or I'm more European than I am Greek and more of an earthling than I am a European. Uh, but yeah, I was born and raised in Greece, so there are stuff coming from there culturally and uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to having good taste in olive oil. Um, <laughs> then I lived a few years as a as a nomad. Then I moved to Germany and now I live in Poland. So. I'm still on the same planet, uh, but in different places, depending on when we're having a call. Cool, thank you. And um, can you just give us briefly a little bit of background about your, um, let's say, trainer credentials? Uh, mm -hmm. How did you, well, yeah, can you just, what what are your kind of fields of work? Um, um, I've been a youth worker for the past 15 years, if I'm counting correctly. It sounds long if i'm saying yeah. it but it feels <laughs> shorter than it is <laughs> um i you know marcus Bresser, right uh, many people in this call know him he's, he's a member of the of the guild like like i am he's one who introduced me to that he it's also his fault that i became a an international youth work trainer because he introduced me to the whole concept and he was in a very very <laughs> very cute way uh, i participated in a training and he was a trainer and uh, he asked me something about how, how the internet works. And the way I answered intrigued him very much. And he said, oh, wow, you didn't use Dragon. You explained it in a way that I understood <laughs> it. It looks like you could be a good trainer. I'm like, oh, yeah. I already, I, I've, I'm already excited to be part of international youth work. And now there's a seed in my head. Yeah. So uh, with his mentorship and with several other opportunities that I took advantage of, I, I basically became an international youth work trainer. Um, my experience has been mostly on an international level. Um, I can't say I worked too much on any sort of localized or national level. Uh, many people, and I admire those who do, are involved in uh, youth councils or uh, have, a, have a good say in what is going on on a national level in uh, youth work. I've only been involved in international uh, NGOs and in international youth work by extension. I've dealt with different kinds of topics from uh, organizational management to HR management to project management. And then I moved on to train the trainer topics and, and more meta topics, let's say. So, yeah, now I do a little bit of everything. But uh, lately I'm uh, I'm combining more experiential learning with gamification and game-based learning because I, I found that to be more close to what expresses me as a as a as a human and as a trainer. Mm -hmm. And it also becomes very, very engaging for the participants. So that's a little bit about me and you um yeah talking of topics and and mm -hmm. uh, using language that everyone can understand. Yeah. Um, what what is your connection? I mean, the intellectual property rights. This is our topic. What is your connection to this to this topic? Yeah. Oh, I did prepare some slides. Maybe I should <laughs> actually share my screen. Uh, uh, might be helpful. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Share this one. Okay. Now this should be visible. Uh, well, yeah, that's the first slide. So yeah, a little bit about me. My connection to intellectual property rights started before my involvement in youth work, uh, where I was very, very heavily involved in uh, art and culture. I was organizing different cultural events in the city that I was living in. Uh, essentially, I was I started studying in a city and I did everything other than studying. <laughs> so I discovered my love for different forms of art, for, for, for dancing, for singing, for movies, for everything. And uh, 
yeah, through that, I learned sometimes the hard way the topic of copyright and what is legal to use and what is not uh -huh. legal to use. Uh, then I was always at the same time heavily involved in, uh, I was a curious person and I still am. So I always uh, tested my hands with any kind of new technology. So I, I was also involved in, in, let's say, software. And through that, I also... Uh, learned the concept of open source software. I will talk a little bit more about it uh, in the in the rest of this uh, uh, webinar. And by the combination of the two, I also ended up uh, with a more meta topic, this topic of the commons, basically, what is public property? What is private property? What is a shared property that people can co-manage and co-handle that either has or has nothing to do with copyright and intellectual property. Uh, so yeah, this, these topics uh, were, were traveling inside my head uh, and I went to even more philosophical aspects of it, like what is freedom? What is free to use? How does it relate to what am I doing? What am I using? What am I creating? And all that. Uh, a couple of examples of things that are related to that that I can mention is uh, I, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, what is called the Commons Fest, which is, it, it happened in 2013, and it basically brought all these topics together. Um, basically, what is freedom? What is protected? What is not protected? Uh, are we sharing art? Are we sharing agriculture? Are we sharing the things that we're sharing in a legal way or in a not legal way and should we? <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, my, my connection to the topic has been, uh, has taken its, has taken me through different stations, let's say. Yeah. Uh, one of the stations that, that I should mention before going to the next question is uh, at some point I was a co-organizer of a TEDx, uh, a TEDx conference. Um, it was the first TEDx in the island of Crete in Greece. And there, uh, I did a lot of things, but I helped a neuroscientist who was a speaker to prepare her presentation. Uh, and a lot of my help basically had to do, oh, do you have the licenses to use this image that I see you're using or not? Hmm, maybe use this one instead. And we had this back and forth several times. Uh, and then after the conference, she said, you know, you seem to know a lot about copyright and license and all that. How would you like to be a speaker in a neuroscience conference? I'm like, but I'm not a neuroscientist. I have nothing to do with that. She said, yes, but you could be speaking about licensing and uh, how that relates to science. Would you like that? And then I ended up being a speaker in a neuroscience conference without having anything to do with neuroscience. Wow. And I almost convinced the participants there to start sharing their um, their papers with open licenses instead of uh, <laughs> journals. I still have some talks with uh, people from that conference. It was yeah. it was a very interesting experience. Um, I, I I I suspect um, that like it sounds like many neuroscientists, um, the people in the youth sector, we are not very good at um, respecting other people's property. Let's say um, mm -hmm. maybe that's not the right way to put it, but we're very good at using. Um, music video film images yeah. um why is this a problem mm -hmm. yeah as a youth worker you're most likely either using background music when you put people brainstorming in groups or you're using uh, certain kinds of images in your presentations if you're using presentations or you're using artwork indeed why is this a problem uh it is a problem first of all because well it can be illegal <laughs> I'm uh, definitely not saying that uh, youth workers intend to do thing to do anything illegally, but despite that, if you're using uh, an image or a video or music or any kind of creative work that you don't have the license to, then you're doing it illegally, and that can be a problem because uh, I'm assuming no youth worker would like to 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 pay huge fines because of. Uh, uh, ignorance on this matter or or go to prison if that ends up being a thing. So one, one reason why we should care is that, yeah, it's, it's important to protect ourselves to avoid any kind of repercussions that we wouldn't want to get into. Um, but then the other question is, yeah, it can be legal or it can be illegal, but should it? So there is this 
philosophical aspect. And that's something I'd like to basically discuss by taking three different aspects into consideration. Um, one aspect is, are you giving the original creator that you're using their work credit? Are you attributing them? Are you saying uh, this painting or this video or this um, text or this music comes from this uh, creator? Are you doing that? First of all, you should be doing that uh, if you want to uh, treat the topic from, from an ethical perspective. But then you should also be aware that that is not enough. <laughs> you may be giving credit to the original creator and it will still be legal if you haven't acquired the license to use it in a public setting. Then the second topic that I, that I, I want us to basically consider is, is the original creator getting paid for it? And there are two aspects of that. If I am getting paid, uh, in this case, as a trainer or as a youth worker, uh, and I'm using this uh, creator's work, shouldn't they get a little bit of a, of a cut of whatever I'm getting paid? So there's the question of royalties and whether it's fair to remunerate people or not. The obvious answer to that is that, yeah, it is fair for everybody whose work is being used and therefore it's valuable to get paid. But how, how does that happen? Uh, we can discuss the practicalities of how that happens later on, but that's something to, to take into account. Uh, and taking another aspect of that same topic is, what if I'm not getting paid? What if I'm doing volunteer work? Then it makes sense that whatever work I'm using for free um, should also not be remunerated, right? That's not what the law says. <laughs> if you're using anything in a public setting, that means if you're using it in a way that somebody else apart from you is listening to that music, watching that video, seeing that image, then if uh, to give a, to give a very clear example, if you're using music from your own Spotify premium account, you're paying for a license, but you're only paying for personal use. So if you're using the same thing in a public setting, as in a training, an international youth work setting, then you don't have the license, even if you're actually paying for it, because it's a public setting. So then so, so there if, is this question even, of remuneration. If even a training room yeah. is a public setting. It, anything that involves basically more than the person who's paying the license yeah. is a public setting. Uh, and it, it goes even further if you're using copyrighted work in, let's say, a public square and you're putting music that you didn't pay licenses for. Then it becomes like ugh, tricky. <laughs> uh, then, yeah, the, the, last, the last topic of whether it's fair or not is what's your intention? Because it's very clear to me that in the vast majority of cases, uh, if I'm a youth worker and I'm using some creative work in my uh, setting, then I definitely don't intend to, to, to scam or uh, to basically do anything unfair to the creator whose work I'm actually valuing. So intentions do matter, but what does this mean from a legal perspective? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So yeah, there are these three topics that are both philosophical and of uh, legal uh, way to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may you may notice on this uh, slide that I have two icons that I want to put as examples. On the left, you can see this birthday cake, and uh, the question there is: Have you song? Have you sang the song "Happy Birthday" to somebody whose birthday it is? Yes. Do you think that's legal? Uh, yes. The correct answer now is indeed yes. <laughs> However, even though the song uh, is, first of all, it's not even clear who was the original creator and if they copied it from somebody else, the original creator is from the 1800s. So it should be copyright free by now. And indeed it is right now in USA and in Europe, it is in the public domain, which means it's free of its copyright. However, that didn't stop Warner Bros. to basically charge everyone who was singing it and they could uh, have access to for copyright. That happened until 2015, that's very recent, where a court decided that, well, it's not actually copyright, it's in the public domain. And then Warner Bros. had to pay back $14 oh. uh, million, dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, but many people went through this process like, what? It was illegal to sing this birthday song that everybody does it. How can this be illegal? And yet, wow. yeah, there are these uh, 
disputes. And then on the right side of the slide, you can see Steamboat Willie, the very first creation of uh, Walt Disney. That image that you see there in the accompanying video was produced in 1928. It entered the public domain. When do you think? Um, I'm going to guess it's something like 50 years after or, or 100 years after, maybe. Hmm. It entered the public domain this January. Oh, really? <laughs> Walt Disney died in 1966 if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the copyright law back then said that it is, uh, yeah, I might be uh, mistaken on this, uh, 20 years after the death of the creator. But then Disney, the company said, okay, let's expand this to 20 more years and then 20 more years and then 20 more years and then 20 more years. So they managed to keep expanding it until 90 years after the death of the original creator. Wow. Yeah, and what is it? If it's 2024, it was 1928, 90, 95 years, I think it's the, yeah. if you take into account the, the month as well. So Walt Disney is very famous in the world of copyright and how far companies can take it. Because it's very clear that Walt Disney has been dead for <laughs> more than half a century. Like what, what, if Walt Disney is not making a profit and he's the original creator. Yeah. Uh, who's making profits? That's That's the thing. I mentioned Spotify before. Out of every uh, song that you play on your own Spotify, even if you're paying, usually the original creators are getting paid cents yeah. on, a, on a euro, on a dollar. Copyright has worked in a way that it basically makes most of the profits to the intermediary. So either the, uh, the, the, the disc record company, the, uh, the producing company of a film, uh, whoever is publishing an image, those that serve as uh, the intermediaries and not the original creators, and definitely not the users, of course. So this goes very, very much into the question of ethics. What exactly is legal, what is not legal, and what should be or should not be legal? So yeah, I wanted to finish this long. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, I an answer. I mean, what we're talking, what well, what you're talking about here, then are are things which are copyrighted. Yeah. So someone has gone to the efforts of. Uh, copyright uh, musicians and artists in general will, will be copywriting their material. And yeah. um, what what about um, uh, like the youth sector um, and and especially the trainers field, uh, where many of us are producing things, but we're oh. not copywriting them. It looks like I had one more slide. So ah. yeah, that's that's a reminder to myself to mention. Oh, but there is one exception. What about memes? Memes use copyrighted work all the time, right? So there is this term that is called fair use that basically allows you to use copyrighted work with exceptions and with a lot of fine tuning if it is for educational purposes, if it is non-profit, if you uh -huh. intend to uh, make a parody of something. The parody is the strongest uh, term of this. So memes are legal even though it's copyrighted material. Right. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe then if we take that into account, it becomes a little bit of a gray ground for youth workers. But to answer your question, what about the work of other trainers? So let's discuss again the three main topics, um, the, the three main aspects that I want to basically tackle uh, throughout this meeting. What about giving credit to the original creator? What about attributing to the original creator? So if you're using something that is produced by another trainer, then it makes sense that you should mention who is the other trainer. So if you're using it in a public setting, as in you're using it with other youth workers, with your um, with the participants of, of a training or a session that you're holding, and you're using somebody else's work, just like any kind of creator, you should mention that, hey, this was introduced to me by this and this person. Then, yeah, it becomes more fair, but is it legal? We'll talk about that in the next question. <laughs> Then there is the topic of remuneration again. So if I'm getting paid and using somebody else's and other trainers uh, work in my training, should they get something? Hmm. That's a, that's a question that the answer is, if I want to be absolutely fair and I want to pay the other trainer whose work I've used in my training, then how exactly do I do this legally? Because that's also tricky. If you want to follow the route and go by the book, 
it's also not the easiest thing. It's a complicated matter. Uh, but I will discuss later how it can become a little bit easier or at least more fair. And then, yeah, the final topic is the intentions. If you're using another trainer's work, then there are two ways to go about it. Either it means you absolutely value the work of another trainer and you basically want to honor that work by also using it and expanding on it. Or there's also the topic, hey, are you still in my work? <laughs> hmm. That That is a big question that if you're using some, another, if you're a trainer and you're using another trainer's work, start by asking this question to yourself. Do I actually do it because I highly value that other trainer and I want to basically expand their work into something that is even more valuable to my participants? Or am I trying to, yeah, do something that is not as fair as it could be? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm just going to have a quick little timeout and just uh, just to remind people that uh, they can they can be putting any questions anybody has, uh, put them into the chat, please. Um, and we can come back to them at the end. Um, so yeah, okay, so um, so yeah, how can we use material that's, that's produced by others um, as trainers? Because yeah, I mean, okay, it's clear in terms of, of uh, officially copyrighted material, uh, but but our colleagues and, and, and such um, from not just Europe, but around the world, yeah, what, what are the ways that we, uh, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you use protected work legally? Uh, one way would be to basically, if you're using commercial work, to pay the license fees for that. There are legal ways to basically seek that. Um, and now it's become a lot easier because there are subscription services that basically provide commercial music that make it easier to at least find out how. So you don't have to basically wonder where exactly do I find the creator to give them money or something like that. Uh, so yeah, answer number one is if you really, really want to use heavily commercialized work, then pay license fees. However, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, from my experience, the... Um, the work of a uh, of a youth worker is not exactly the most ludicrous. <laughs> and uh, to give an example of how far that can go, uh, just last week I discussed with a youth worker from uh, Austria, and uh, he runs youth camps. So there is a very clearly public setting, and they are using a lot of uh, famous music because it makes sense for their setting. They're also using some videos. They're also using some artwork. So the go the legal route and then pay license fees. The amount he told me they're paying annually is close to 20,000 euros. Holy schmoly. That's a big amount. <laughs> so if you are a youth worker and you want to follow the legal route or, well, you're afraid that basically there's no other way around it, then these are the prices we're talking yeah. If it is, a, in this case, it is a very public setting because basically our outdoor activities, so the public that will listen will not just be the the participants, but the general public. So that's that's always that always costs more. They basically what is the audience? But yeah, they, these are the amounts that we're talking. If you want to follow very heavily, to use very heavily commercialized work that is movies from Hollywood, that is music for from uh, I don't know EDM or whatever company you prefer, music from famous artists. That that's what you would expect. But there are other ways to use uh, legally protected work. So uh, right now we are using a lot of software to basically, uh, for example, create presentations like this presentation is on Canva. Check the license of the software that you're using because it is very likely that it includes license to several images that you can legally use. So if you're using, if you're using Canva, if you're using uh, if you're using Adobe products, if you're using, if you're making videos on YouTube and you want to use music in there, there is already a huge library of music that you can use for free or included in your license. So now that we're using software for almost everything, the easiest way to see if you can use images, videos, music is to see what is included in this license that you're paying. Most likely it will include things that you can use legally. So that's another thing. Check if you can already use it with existing mm -hmm. uh, software. Then the final thing is 
use fairy license work. Uh, I'm going to talk later about a license called Creative Commons. So that's one license, uh, <laughs> and it's not the only one, that it's the most famous, that basically allows fair use. It gives you some uh, limitations on how you can use it, but it allows you to use it even commercially, sometimes for free or with a much more accessible price than 20,000 euros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, using licenses like that can really, really help the work of a trainer who wants to be legal when it comes to intellectual property. Uh, and yeah, on the topic of, there is still a lot of work that is on the public domain. That means that it is legally free to use without having to either pay any kind of license or even attribute the creator. So there is, yeah, there, there, there are sources that you can use. Uh, I've put a few there on this slide that you can use that uh -huh. uh, contain uh, images, videos, or, or icons, or music, and are, are pretty decent that you can use uh, for free or with a low license. Uh, to mention very briefly what is each, Unsplash is one of the largest depositories of uh, photos. And these are photos that are very high quality submitted by users who basically just want to submit them in a way that is free. It's in the public domain. All the images in Unsplash are in the public domain, even if they're very recent. The image that I use here was submitted today, uh, I think four hours before, the, uh, before this webinar. So I use it for that particular reason. This is taken from Unsplash, and that's from a creator that basically uploaded the work there uh, from a photographer who uploaded the work there and say, hey, you can use it for free. So Unsplash is one of these repositories that you can use photos that are very high quality for free. Pexels is another uh, website that also has royalty-free photos, and it also has some videos that you can use. Then the Noun project uh, has incredible quality icons that you can use uh, that are, yeah, that are way too many for anything you can imagine. They, you can always find something that is fitting to your uh, purpose. And all the icons are licensed using uh, different kinds of Creative Commons licenses, which means either they are free to use for personal use, or you can pay something very little, or, or you can give attribution to the creator, which allows you to use it for free, or you have to pay a very small fee. It's something like uh, between one and three euros per icon. So it's not high if you're using a small amount of icons. And it also has this annual subscription that is also very, very accessible in price and you can you can be covered with that. Then CC Mixter, it is a platform that has millions of different songs that you can use. So it has music that is licensed under Creative Commons that you can use, either with attribution or some of them are completely free. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Free Music Archive is also, uh, it's owned by... Um, uh, um, a public institution of USA, and it has a lot of music that is that is excellent to use. That is, yeah, high quality and free to use, royalty free. Well, I've just added the um, the, the all of them. Well, mm -hmm. added them into the uh, chat, so um, yeah. people can copy paste uh, as as they wish. Uh, we have a, a question from someone called Katya. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm about under. what about usage for educational purposes? How, does that change anything? Uh, it's it's a gray area. So the question there is: Is it free to use if I do it for educational purposes? There are licenses like uh, what is called fair use that have this exception. But the question is, if I get sued for license work, am I able to prove to the court that, hey, I actually use it for educational purposes, therefore it goes under fair use? And that's not a clear-cut answer because there are limitations to what counts, what doesn't count. Uh, there are different rules that basically play into that, like whether it was a for-profit or non-profit use, whether it was uh, genuinely educational, what parts of the song, video, image you actually use. Uh, there are different elements there that might give you the impression that you can use it for free because there is this law, but it becomes tricky if you try to prove this in, in the court of law. Uh, so then a follow-up question to that could be, when will this actually become a problem? Because it will become a problem usually if somebody sues you. When will mm -hmm. somebody sue you for using work in a training event? 
either somebody will snitch you from your tra from your trainees uh, or somebody who I don't know basically believes you're doing something very legal and maybe they're right will will basically uh, sue you somebody has to sue you or somebody think Right. Somebody, something, uh, I'm saying something because if, for example, you upload a video on YouTube and it has a copyrighted music, the uh, YouTube has a detection, uh -huh. um, yes. a bot that basically, if there is background music that is that you don't have the license to, then it will mute your video, your entire video. Yeah. So either somebody has to tell the court that you did something illegal or a software will detect that you did something that might be illegal and then you have to justify it. And and actually now with with digital media, um, yeah. you know, a lot of our a lot of training sessions can end up um, on on social media. So there's yep. also other ways for other people to see uh, yep. what what's happening and 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 therefore what's being used. Yep. Okay, it's an interesting thing to think about and remember. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, all the images that are in my presentation are <laughs> checks for license because uh, I either use them directly from Canva or this particular one I downloaded from Unsplash mm -hmm. or anything else that I'm using, I'm double checking if it is actually legal to use right. for me. Yeah. So that, for example, this will be shared on, on YouTube as a video. This could yes. have been taken down if I was using anything illegal. Yes. Luckily, I'm not because it was, this whole topic <laughs> made me think <laughs> <Yes>. twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be embarrassing. Uh, um, so um, there's, we're talking about social media here, and and one of the things which has really developed in the last couple of years, uh, well, it's been developing for a long time, but for most of us, it's it's come about in the last couple of years, is the whole uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um. What, can we? Can you talk a little bit about that and and how that fits into the picture of of uh, copyright and and well, not just copyright, but protection and and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, the image that I used in this slide is AI generated from within Canva. So how can this be free? So let's talk again about these three aspects. Is the creator credited? Hmm, it's AI. There is no original creator. Machine created this. If I pay a license to the machine that allows me to use this image, then I have the right to use it. Cool. Uh, if you have a mid-journey subscription, the, the second level, I think, and upwards allows you to use even commercially the work that is created there. Uh, and the same, if you, the, same, uh, the same license exists in, in all the AI-generated, uh, generative AI software that you can have access to as an as a average user now. The question there is, how can it be free? Is it, is it really fully created by a machine, generative AI uses work that is originally created by somebody else, and it basically statistically analyzes original work, millions and millions of uh, uh, instances of this work in order to create something that is similar. It's a machine. It doesn't have intelligence. It cannot create something truly authentic. It can only create what stems from this statistical analysis and uh, advanced way to recreate and piece in together parts of existing cooperative work. You would assume that the original creators have been paid for their work to be used. No, nope. the very recent, uh, what was it? Two, three days ago, uh, Sam Altman, who's the, the head of uh, uh, OpenAI, uh, basically got uh, into a kind of a court deal because he hasn't paid the license to any of the original creators that uh, whose work has been used and analyzed in order to create either text or uh, images or anything else. And he even said that uh, if I would pay anyone that whose work has been analyzed, then I wouldn't be making profit as a company. We're talking about a very wealthy company right now. The, the answer to whether, and it goes to the second topic, is the person whose original work is being used in order for AI to generate this work uh, remunerated fairly? I think the answer to that is very similar to how does this uh, simple white t-shirt cost four euros if a Labor Day in Europe already costs <laughs> 10 times that? How am I paying four euros for this t-shirt? It's very similar. Somebody's being exploited somewhere. 
So even though you you want to follow the law, you pay a license that allows you to use uh, commercially work that is being created by a generative AI software, there are these ethical concerns behind it. Who's getting exploited? Or is somebody getting exploited? That's something that that is a, it's a very strong... Um, it's the, it's the one of the most important topics in in ethics and uh, computer science these days exactly because of the popularization of ai and then yeah the the final topic is that of intentions so i as a user uh, especially if i'm a youth worker who <laughs> we all know very well I, i'm not getting paid uh, high enough to basically hire a, a painter or a musician, uh, but I am paying my fair share into getting a license of a generative AI software, uh, it makes sense that I can use that. I'm following the law, I'm using that, and it's it, it's legal. But what is behind that? It's, uh, the, the question of ethics and AI is is an enormous one right now. So the short answer is, if you're using generative AI, yeah, you're most likely include in your license the ability to use it. But there are these ethical concerns to always think about behind it. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, oof, there's so many uh, things can come out of that. We're, we're not going to stay with the with the whole AI thing um, mm -hmm. because I, I, I think it would be good to um, to move to actually what can we do mm -hmm. uh, for our for our own work? Um, so what what are our options as uh, as ordinary people? Uh, basically, we're, we're not uh, Taylor Swift or um, <laughs> uh, Sam, what's his name from OpenAI? Um, yep. You know, we don't have a, a bank of lawyers behind us. So uh, yeah. how how do we how do you know? I'm I'm a trainer. I produce something. How do I? What mm -hmm. can I do to protect my work? Yeah. So there are two questions to take into account. Uh, first of all. What is it that you're producing? Is it a process that you're following? Uh, as in, is it a workshop format? Is it, a, 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 for example, you're following the experiential learning cycle, trademark term. Uh, you're following some, some, some idea that came up to you that works very well for your participants, but this is just a process that we're designing, that we're describing. Or did you create original uh, text or an image or some other thing that basically exists in a, in a in a tangible form, let's say, to put it lightly. If it is a process, that falls away from what can be trademarked, um, mm -hmm. what can be copyrighted. Uh, I work a lot with games lately, and for example, in games, uh, artwork is very heavily copyrighted, and you there is a very clear license behind it and all that. That means the illustrations, the, uh, the the design of the pieces that you're using, the, all the different types of artwork are copyrighted, and that's very clear. But what about the mechanics of the game, the rules that you have to follow, uh, the, the design behind the design? That cannot really be copyrighted. So it's the same for uh, your work as a trainer. If what you're trying to protect is a process, then you can't really copyright it unless you turn it into a publishable format, in which case then, yeah, you can claim that, oh yeah, this text that describes my work, that, that is copyrighted. Mm -hmm. The process itself is not copyrighted because it can't, but the text is, so maybe you have some grounds there. So yeah, that's the first question. If it's a process, then good luck. But if it's content, then yes, you can yeah. license it. Then the second question is, is it published somewhere? Because you can only copyright and protect legally something that is published somewhere. Uh -huh. So if it's only in your head or even in your computer, but in a, uh, on your desktop, let's say, and it's not published somewhere that is public in a library, on a website, uh, on the cloud, somewhere. If it is not published somewhere, then how exactly are you going to protect it? But if it is published somewhere, then you can basically, uh, you can have a copyright claim on it. And then how do you protect it? Um, there is a thing called Creative Commons licenses that makes it easier, much, much easier than having to go to the court and basically register for an ISBN code if it is a book uh, or some other kind of license to protect your work. 
Creative Commons makes it easy because all you have to do is go to this website, decide what you allow and what you don't allow from whoever wants to use your work, as long as it's content and it's published. And then it guides you to basically include the license terms wherever you publish it. Do you publish it on a website? Do you do it on the, uh, what is it, the Salto Toolkit? Do you do it on your own website? Do you publish it in the blog of the International Youth World Trainers Guild? Uh, do you share it on, on whatever? If you share it somewhere that somebody else can access it, then it is in your interest to basically choose a license that works for your own ethics. And Creative Commons basically helps you to do that and publish the license with it. Mention the license on the thing that you're publishing, and that will make it easier for people who want to use your work to know what you allow and what you don't with their work. And uh, what what are some of those um, uh, variations then? Uh, Creative Commons is is not just one thing, from what you're mm -hmm. saying. It's, it's many things, so, yeah. so or, or many versions. Yeah. Uh, so what what are those options? What I will do right here is I will stop sharing the. Uh, presentation and I will now share what exists on this uh, license chooser and then I'll switch back to the presentation so here so you can see my screen right so yes. this is how this looks say um, I created a text that I created a, a kind of a information booklet on something that I uh, that I got paid to create and it's intellectual output of an Erasmus Plus project and I want to publish it on, on Salto. How do I license it? Well, a good thing to do is to go to this website and basically select what are the elements that you want to take into account. So first of all, it helps you by asking, do you already know the license or not? Let's pretend that we don't. Yeah. Let's go to the next step. If it's so, me, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so question number one, do you want people to basically credit you for your work? Do you want people to say, hey, this is Nick Patterson's work? You only want people to, uh, we only want to allow people to use, it, your, to use your work if they credit you as original creator. Yes. Let's say yes, because it sounds fair, right? Yes. There you go. That's element number one. Let's go to the next element. So what just want... appeared on the right of the screen then? Uh, yeah, what, what is uh, displayed ah, this here is... is basically the result of the choices that you're making. Ah, okay. So the second question there is, do you want to allow others to use your work commercially? That means, do you want people to get paid for using this? There is a tricky aspect there, because basically that doesn't mean necessarily that you use in a training the exact booklet that is copyrighted. It means that you are creating something, some kind of your own version, and then you are selling it as your own. So in the, in this applies to me taking uh, Nick Patterson's book, crediting Nick Patterson, because we, we selected that before, um, doing something with it, and then selling my own copy to another person. So do you want this to happen or not? No. No. Okay. Then that adds another element to the license. Uh -huh. Okay, so now we have uh, so yeah. there's different symbols appearing, yeah. Exactly. So there is the 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 CC, and then the yeah. the person symbol is about attribution, and then the yeah the dollar dollar crossed out is the uh, commercial. Exactly. Yeah. So then the other element is: Do you want others to to basically edit your work, remix it, adapt it? Do you want people to make changes to this work? Uh, yes. The previous uh, items obviously apply. So. If I want to adapt Nick Patterson's work, I will do it by crediting Nick Patterson and I will not sell it. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yes. Cool. That helps. Then final question is, do you want to allow others to share adaptations of your work under any terms? This question basically means, do you want to oblige people who hmm. share their own adaptations to use the same license or do you want them to choose for themselves? I, ooh, I don't know, Tricky. actually. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding the, the differences here. Um, so if you select no, look what appears. Uh -huh. okay. Uh, okay. The, yeah, so if you choose here that others must use the same exact license. 
So whoever, whatever I, if I adapt Nick Patterson's work and credit Nick Patterson and promise not to sell what I've created, uh, I also should publish my adaptation under the exact same license. But if, if you select yes, then yeah, basically you don't oblige them. I can choose a license for my own. Okay. What Now that you know, what do you choose? Uh, no. Okay. So you want people to use the same license, right? Yeah. Cool. Then... This has some uh, background check here. Do you have the authority? Are you basically the original creator? Or do you have the license to, to use this thing that you're licensing right now? Yes. Yeah. I would say. Then have you understood these terms? Do you understand basically what is written here? Yes. I guess I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read that fast, but I'm going to say yes. <laughs> yeah. And then the final is, do you understand that this is not a revocable license? That means if you decide to change it later for the same uh, kind of product, then whoever used it under the, the, the current license is only obliged to follow what you decided here, not the updated version. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. So if you understand these, then yeah. you have a license. And then you can also mention how you want this to be attributed. So it asks you for the exact title of this work, the creator with your full legal name, yeah. a link, to this work, uh, the, whatever kind of website or profile you have online, and the year was created. And then it gives you the options, whether you are publishing this work online. So it gives you three ways uh, that are easier to basically embed on a website, or if it's a printable thing, in which case it basically uh, gives you what to copy where. So uh -huh. if it's, for example, a booklet that is printed, then I need to copy this text uh, and include it in the in a page on the booklet that describes yeah, the license. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. All right. So that makes it easier, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Imagine, imagine doing the same uh, by having to go to a court and then pay all. The this is free. Also, this yeah. is you don't have to pay a license in order to use this license chooser. Yeah, that helps a lot. Cool. Thank you. Wow, that was really, uh, really useful actually. Because um, I don't know for others, but I, I've gone on to the many, many years ago. I came across Creative Commons, and I think it was just a very basic uh, principle. Yep. And then I went back to it when we started this project, and I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> they added stuff, and it's a lot of legal legal speak, which I'm not sure I, I completely understand. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was really good to go through the process. Um. Where are we up to? Um, yeah, and the, but cop, uh, Creative Commons is not the only option. There uh, are... Yeah, there are custom options. Uh, for example, uh, say you're publishing a YouTube video. YouTube has the choice to, to either license it under a Creative Commons license or it has its own version of this license that only, obviously, this is only applicable to YouTube videos and nothing else. Uh, but for example, if you if that's something that you do, then Google uh, helps you to choose a specific license that has similar terms with Creative Commons in, in most cases. But yeah, let's say that it gives a little bit of more, more rights to Google than it does to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, there are depending on where you publish your medium, there are dedicated licenses from the software you're publishing it to, to uh, the type of work to uh, anything else. And then, um, yeah, like yeah. you say, then then people just have to, uh, if they're printing it off, they need to ensure that the um, the 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 CC and other logos or text is is there. Or I need to make sure for myself that it's yeah. there. Uh, and then if I'm printing off someone else's, and I know that it's uh, uh, Creative Commons, um, just to make sure that you follow I've the printed rules. it with with the correct text as well. Yeah, yeah? exactly. Okay, so it's it's very much based on on uh, people's principles and values. Uh, Creative Commons is yes, yeah, it's and, not and controlled respect. by uh, big uh, copyright companies that want to be these intermediaries that I mentioned before, like yeah. RIAA for music or big film producers. Yeah, yeah, it's based on human language and uh, yeah, this this idea that you as the creator want to choose what you allow and what not based on your own set of ethics as long yeah. as it follows what's, what this translates in legalese. 
Yeah. And then there are things called open education resource and the open yeah. source license. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to very briefly uh, talk about when did Creative Commons appeared. They appeared in the early 2000s. Uh, there was this lawyer, was still exists, <laughs> uh, who's called Lawrence Lessig. And he's an American lawyer who was very much disappointed and frustrated with the copyright laws and exactly the fact that it basically benefits huge companies, but it doesn't benefit the creators. And it also makes things very, very difficult for the users. So good thing he was a lawyer <laughs> with a specialization in intellectual property. So he created his own license that he called Creative Commons. <laughs> right. And he published it together with his book that I'm referencing here that is, of course, published under Creative Commons, so you can download it and read it yeah. for free. <laughs> uh, as long as if you want to give it to someone else, then you follow the specific rules, you know? So it makes it easier. Uh, this book called Free Culture uh, that basically analyzes mostly the ethics behind it and, uh, yeah, how, how those ethics translates to a, a human language that anybody can understand and choose as a creator uh, and benefit themselves as a user as well. So yeah, he created the Creative Commons and he based his rationale behind the Creative Commons behind the four basic freedoms of free software. You may have heard this term, free and open source software. These are not uh, synonyms, mm -hmm. uh, but there are these four basic freedoms that exist in free and open source software that he also got inspired by to create these Creative Commons licenses. And these four freedoms are, as a user, you're given the freedom to use it. So basically, if it is a book, you're able to read it. Uh, you're free to study it. You're free to analyze what is there, understand it and all that. Uh, you're free to modify it. That's a very important part of the of open source type of licenses. This adaptation that you chose on the um, Creative Commons chooser, that you, you can basically improve this work. Uh, my grandma's recipe for, for cake. Mm -hmm. I came up with something else to add there. It's not copyrighted. I improved on it. I added something to culture. That's say something basic that basically we don't think what is copyrighted and what is not. But yeah. it, it is essentially part of culture. And the whole meaning of these protections or uh, freedoms has to do with whether people are being treated fairly uh, and culture continues to grow instead of being gatekept. And the final freedom is, of course, the freedom to redistribute it. If I made this improved version of my grandma's cake, am I able to, to basically give the recipe to you, not just the cake, but the recipe itself? Hmm. That's a topic. That that's what we are analyzing basically with uh, freedoms of free software, and in a similar manner, what is analyzed in Creative Commons. And then, yeah, you you mentioned open educational resources. Um, right now, it has become a more a more common uh, place term. Uh, for example, if you if you if you have an Erasmus Plus project like this one, and you come up with intellectual outputs. Mm -hmm. then the European Union obliges you to publish those as edu open educational resources. That means that they basically follow the same four principles above. Uh, and the easy way to make this happen is using a Creative Commons license. So right. that all it means, and the whole idea behind it is this ethical aspect. Are you able to freely study it as a student? Are you able to improve upon it? Are you able to contribute something to society based on what exists on this uh, written, printed, published work. Yeah. That's the whole point of these licenses. That on the one hand, you protect the original creator, but on the other hand, you make it easy for people to contribute to culture, and in this case, education and learning, which yeah. is very much aligned with the principles of non-formal education and the, the whole environment we're working with. And that's why this makes the whole topic relevant to the holistic trainer. So... For example, we, we've produced a number of intellectual outputs. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a number of videos, um, uh, some uh, audio interviews, uh, publication uh, called The Guide, mm -hmm. um, and content of a website. So if we want to protect this material uh, in a very open way and with Creative Commons, is it, do we then put the guild as the uh, as the owner? 
does it have to be a human person or, or can it be um, a thing? <laughs> it can be either a, a person or a legal person. That means either uh, the individual who created it or the organization who holds basically the copyright in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the terminology. A human person is is a human and a person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, legal person. That's the other category. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, if you want to publish anything uh, from the holistic trainer uh, as an open educational resource, the best way to do it, uh, depending on where you publish it, because they may have limitations on on the on the space where you you, you publish it. Uh, but yeah, usually the best way to do this is select an appropriate Creative Commons license. Make sure that this is included on the. Uh, intellectual output, whatever yeah. format you choose, and publish it in a way that whoever reads it, uh, watches it, listens to it, or whatever else knows that this is the license and yeah. has an understanding of how they can take it forward, how they can use it. Yeah. Okay. I think that's something we need to uh, to take up with the rest of the team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's, and and probably a number of other things in the guild as well actually uh, could could do with some uh, protecting. Yeah. Super. Um, I don't have any more questions. Do you have any more slides? <laughs> yeah. If people want to connect with me and talk more about this topic or anything else, then you can either scan this QR code or just find me on LinkedIn. And lately, it's the platform that I respond to, so yeah. why not yeah. connect there? <laughs> Super. And uh, yeah, last chance then for any other questions from anybody, again, including the team. Katya, you look like you're wanting to come in. Yeah? No, no, I'm just, yeah, just, no, no, I don't have any questions. Everything is clear. Yeah. <laughs> very much. Now I'm more, no, because of this myth about the educational purpose, I just remember that preparing some MOOCs, for example, but mm -hmm. I've been always checking these images, no, because if it's massive open online course, yeah. it's like public. But then sometimes we have these closed courses, like e-learning part of training mm -hmm. 25 people. And then from somewhere I got information that maybe we don't, in this case it's not so important because it's educational only for twenty five people, so it's not. Yeah, so I wouldn't count on it. That's that that is illegal in practice. The question there is the, of minding or not minding is whether somebody will sue you. I would say play it safe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wealth of resources that you can use, and by using works that basically. Uh, use, for example, Creative Commons licenses, then you keep promoting that and people learn more about it and value it more. Yeah. It's not only that uh, this is the fair thing to do or it's it's the one that allows you to do it legally more easily, but it's also that since it works in a better way, both for the creator and for the user, why not promote it? Yeah. No, no, we always was putting this link of uh, at, uh, whom, from where it taken. All oh, this is mm -hmm. uh, something that you do. No, yes, I'm, I like it, Creative Commons. Yeah, it's super simple. <laughs> um, and and yeah, it doesn't have to be something, I, I, I'm i just thinking of something I produced uh, 12 years ago, um, mm -hmm. which I've seen in a publication without any reference to me. Um, so, uh, we, uh, and it's a youth partnership publication. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be good to to have some some backup in a sense to say, hey, this mm -hmm. is this is protected, and you need to respect that. Yeah. Um, rather than me just jumping up and down with an angry email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then you need to have the legal rights to basically say, hey, this is my work. Why did you use it? Yeah, yeah. That's the answer I mean. may easily yeah. be, well, you didn't license it, so how am I supposed to know? Huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So now you know. <laughs> So um, thank you very, very much, Antonis, uh, for this. It was uh, really interesting, really useful. There's, there's also thanks in the chat. Uh, I don't know whether you've had a chance to see that.